Dear students, today we shall learn about recent changes in the caste system. Okay? As we have already come to know about the meaning, definition and characteristic of caste system, so today we shall learn about recent changes. Right? So before that, we should have some idea what is change and why change is necessary. Right? So, now, uh, what I want to say, the change is a social process and it is universal to all type of societies, whether it is African, European, Indian, whatever it may be, but change must come to every type of society. So, any change that affect the social structure, social function or institution, whatever it may be, but it is universal, it is ubiquitous and unavoidable. Simply we cannot avoid the forces of the changes that is affecting society. Okay? So how can the major institution of the society remain far behind? So definitely those institutions are going to be affected by various forces of change. As you know that caste system that occupies a very prominent place in our Indian society. It is regarded as one of the very uh, important social institution which determines social stratifications and it is with us since ages. So now what we see that lots of changes has come into. As I told you that change is the unchanging law of the nature, it must happen. So despite of the rigid character of the caste system, change has affected our institution. Uh, that is how the, it has also affected the caste system. Okay? So while discussing about various changes what appeared in the caste system, we must focus on those structural changes as well as the functional changes that has occurred in the caste system. So what are structural changes that has occurred and how it is different than the functional changes which has uh, occurred in the caste system that we shall discuss. So uh, initially a question arises that whether due to such forces of changes, uh, whether caste system is disappearing, disintegrating, disintegrating or it is completely uh, eliminating or weakening in the process or it is tuning itself how to adjust to the modern forces of the changes, whether it is disappearing or it is adopting, adopting new technique to survive in the changing environment. So on these questions that we shall discuss the changes of the caste system. So before going into detail about all those changes that has affected caste system, we must focus some of the theoretical background taking into account of the viewpoint of eminent sociologists, what they have observed about the changes in the caste system. Starting with Harold Gould, as you know that he is also a very prominent sociologist who says that caste persists in the form of complex network of interest groups in urban communities and it functions as a system of social strata in the rural community. So Gold says that caste system persists today, there is no doubt of it, but it persists in two different forms. As in the rural community, it, it plays that uh, old character, that means it determines the Indian social stratification, it stratifies the whole social fabric on the basis of its hierarchical uh, pattern, uh, the values and the norms of the uh, caste system uh, which is based on ritual specialization, heredity or uh, occupational specialization. But in the urban community, the character of the caste system is little bit different. It is not that much old. It has accepted new elements into it, it has uh, you know it has given a new face or uh, you can say it has adapted to the new environment of the modern society which is represented by the urban community. So we see that the old pattern of the caste system exists at the same time some new elements has been added into it. So we say that caste persists in the form of complex network of interest groups in the urban communities. It it has, it has uh, 
been transformed into an interest group because here the purpose of caste system is just not to uh, fulfill the ritual or the religious requirement, but to fulfill many political, economic and social interest of respective caste groups. So, the caste groups which is existing in the urban communities that that is more known as an interest group you know complex setup. And Weising as you know that is a very famous Indian sociologist has written a book uh, uh, modernization of Indian tradition where he mentions that caste exists both as an order and as a phenomena of change. So, again it uh, reflects the dual character of the caste system. At one side we see that the uh, old structure of the caste system is retained because it is the cultural value of the society that it is very hard to change the inner core of the caste system. So, structurally it will remain as it is. And secondly, when you look at the functional aspect of the caste system with related to some behavioral changes, some phenomenal changes, we find that there, there are uh, some uh, forces of changes that has affected the internal functioning of the caste system and the behavioral pattern. Uh, which uh, occur within the caste frame. Okay. Next to uh, next uh, moving to next sociologist uh, Louis Dumont and M. N. Srinivas and also many other Indian sociologists, foreign sociologists, they have agreed to this point that hierarchical structure of the caste system has remained same. There is no change to the hierarchical uh, structure though uh, there are certain changes in the sphere of hierarchy that we shall discuss in uh, later. But today what uh, what Dumont and Shinibas want to point out the structural hierarchy is still act as a dominant feature of the caste system, but some functional changes has come into and which is reflected in the intra caste relations and inter caste relation. What is intra caste relation? The intra caste relation refers to the relations between individual members within one particular caste group, right. How do they behave among themselves within remaining within one caste group? And what is inter caste group? When you speak about the interrelationship or behavioral pattern that exists between the members of various caste groups that is how it uh, constitute the composite whole. So, in, in this behavioral aspect many changes has come into. Okay. Now, coming to the Sus Susan Bale, uh, she has studied uh, caste system deeply by taking into account of the caste system existing in the 18th century till the modern period. So, he she had made a very thorough uh, analysis of the uh, process of changes that has occurred within the caste system. What has she experienced? That caste has shifted from a traditional form to the modern form passing through different phases of the historical growth. So, keeping in pace with the political, economic, social changes, caste has also changed itself in many contexts. So, Bell says that it refers to a sequence of complex but intelligible changes that has affected uh, the entire society. Okay. So, change what has occurred within the caste system, it has occurred the entire social, it has affected the entire social system. So, moving to next, uh, we still now we can discuss about the major changes that has affected the caste system. So, first change that appears before us the character, the religious character of the caste system. We know that caste system is very much justified in the name of religion, but what is the present picture? Earlier, whatever hierarchy was maintained, the ritual distance was maintained, the, the related purity pollution concept, uh, you know the social distance, segregation, everything was justified in the name of religion. And people they had a very strong fear if they do not abide to the caste norm, they, then they, they may fall into, uh, they, they, then they, it may be sinful and uh, once again they may may take birth in the lower caste group. So, that fear is no more with the people of present days. So, that is decreasing importance of religious doctrine and rituals which were justifying caste system earlier. 
and everything was explained from the religious point of view, whether it is about uh, Papa, Punya, Karma, Karma Fala, you know. So, when uh, a person was uh, suffering for being uh, for taking birth in a low caste family and was subject to so, uh, so many discrimination, it was justified by saying that perhaps she, uh, the person has done something wrong in the past life. So, for that matter, he has to suffer in the present life by taking birth in, in a Dalit family or in a low caste family. But due to growth of scientific temperament, due to emergence of secular ideas, democratic and egalitarian ideas, now people have no faith to accept those age old sayings that, that if you follow the caste norm, then uh, my uh, future life in the next birth, uh, next birth will be secure. So, the faith on uh, such theories, the religious theories, you know, has lost its grip. Now, people are, uh, you know, they are changing their outlook. They have become very pragmatic and practical to understand uh, the social situations. Now, coming to the next, the change in the social hierarchical pattern, okay. So, social hierarchy is one of the very prominent feature of the caste system. Perhaps this is the only uh, characteristic which gives the uh, total image of the caste system. We cannot understand caste system without social hierarchy. As we have uh, already learned about social hierarchy, which refers to a grading pattern in the society, where the people and their uh, uh, groups are not placed in the equal positions. So, on the basis of the status accorded to a particular group, you know, the people they occupy a particular position or rank in the society. So, that is what we understand social hierarchy. So, accordingly, the reward, award, uh, you know, resources, privileges are distributed differently to different caste groups or sub caste groups. Now, we see that some changes has come into the hierarchical pattern, but what kind of changes? As I have told you, uh, while taking the viewpoint of M. N. Srinivas, the change has taken place only in the functional aspect of the caste system, not in the structural aspect of the caste system. So, there is change in the functional hierarchy. What is functional hierarchy? That, that is reflected in the interpersonal relations or inter-caste relations, which is uh, manifested in various forms, either maybe in the rit practice of rituals, practice of uh, many custom traditions or, uh, you know, adhering to a particular ideology. So, there are changes in this, um, uh, in this, what you say, the behavioral aspect, but you say that there is changes in the functional hierarchy. But while talking about the structural hierarchy, it is still intact. That means, a Brahmin still holds the superior position in the society uh, or he is regarded as occupying the topmost position in the social hierarchy keeping the Shudras at the bottom and as we know the hierarchy as it, it looks like a pyramid. So, that structural hierarchy is still with us, there is no change to it. But what has uh, made the changes in the functional hierarchy? Uh, basically, the modern forces of uh, the modern society like the political patronage, accessibility to the market, social net, uh, network and modern education, so all those forces which has forced people to go through series of the changes, which has brought changes in their life and the lifestyle. So, that has affected the uh, behavioral uh, pattern of the uh, caste uh, group members. So, we see that there is a new pattern of relationship uh, in the caste system. Okay? So, uh, here uh, in this uh, table, you can uh, observe it closely, how uh, uh, different modern factors that decides the hierarchical pattern which was existing in the old society and the hierarchical pattern which, which is existing in the uh, 
modern society or the present society. So, what are those factors basically as I told you the political patronage that means the political affiliation how much your caste group or a member of a particular caste group has political connection. So, that determines his status in the society. It is no more the ritual background or the caste background. Similarly, the modern education uh, accessibility to the market or you know if somebody has got a good salaried job uh, has gone up in the economic ladder uh, or accessibility to various other type of resources that are available in the society and accessible to accessibility to social network. How much uh, relationship that he has established, how much linkage that he has established with the outside world. You know these are the factors actually which determine this uh, social position of a person or social position of a group. So, uh, for, for, for this emerging new factors, we see the change in the hierarchical pattern of the caste system. Earlier, what was the uh, old hierarchical pattern? It was basically uh, between master, either between master and servant or creditor or debtor or between landlord, tenant. So, basically the class division was between pure group, impure group, sacred group or uh, not sacred group. So, old hierarchy was dividing uh, society on the basis of ritual line, on the basis of certain kind of social prescription which was binding upon the people. Okay? So, we learned about the old hierarchical pattern, but now we say learn about the new hierarchical pattern. What changes has come in the new hierarchical pattern? What we see that the new hierarchy uh, which divides the society that is not on the basis of the old caste norm, rather it is, ba it is based on the present modern day uh, social factors. So, that is how it divide the society into powerful and powerless or it divides the society between educated and uneducated, employed, unemployed, semi-employed. Now, these new categories which have come into that is giving, giving the real picture of the social stratification nowadays. So, caste hierarchy is with us, but the present hierarchy is dominating or you can say it is coming to the front with more force. Now, moving to the next uh, point of change, the decline in the supremacy of Brahmin. We know that caste system is always understood in the Indian context from the viewpoint of Brahminical supremacy. The Brahmi Brahmins, they have always enjoyed all power or privileges of the society. They have dictated the societal norms. They have created conditions for the people of the low caste or who are in the Dalit caste group to, uh, you know, to, to live, lead their life. But now, this is not the situation. Though Brahminical supremacy still exists in some parts of the country, but we cannot say that Brahminical supremacy is, f is fully under, uh, uh, under, under its dominance in the present context. So, today we find that government jobs, modern education, you know, those who people who have access to the external world or who are using uh, the, the market forces and have come up in the socioeconomic ladder, you know, their achievement qualities which the, their inner ability which help them to move up in the uh, social um, economic ladder that has somehow determining the status of the people. So, it is no more the ritual status of the people which is defining their social status. For that matter, Brahmins are no more regarded as the supreme dictator or holding the supreme position in the society. See, and Emin Srinivas in his uh, uh, study who has done extensive study on the caste system in India, uh, during his research, he has introduced a concept called dominant caste. So, dominant caste, you can say it is a sort of replacement to the uh, upper caste. Uh, what was believed that perhaps upper caste people were dominating the, the, uh, the locality or the entire social system. But what uh, the present scenario as I mentioned has pointed out that the, the caste group which is locally dominant 
you know, who is locally powerful, influential, who has linked with the political parties or who, who holds enough landed property or who are more educated, you know, they are known as the dominant caste people and they are exerting enormous influence on their respective uh, locality. So, somehow uh, you can say that uh, there is decline in the supremacy of Brahmin caste, but still uh, importance of Brahmins um, is visible in many parts of the country. Okay? So, moving to next uh, about the caste norms, we see that old caste norms have lost its importance. So, in the present scenario, uh, the previous caste norms which was making the whole caste system rigid and very closed, unchangeable, it is not like that. So, what are those changes that has affected uh, the caste norm? We find there are changes in with regard to commensality, that means the eating and the drinking habit on the basis of the caste background or caste identity is no more. Uh, as kacha food, uh, pakka food, I think that there is nobody who is following it strictly. So, there is the importance of kacha food, um, pakka food or with regard to uh, what to drink or how to prepare food or uh, with whom to dine, you know, all those uh, uh, restrictions, uh, you know, that has lost its importance. I am not saying that it is not at all prevalent. In some parts of the country, it is still prevalent but it has lost its previous importance and there is flexibility in the social intercourse, how the people of different caste groups are, we are mixing uh, with each other with lots of restriction. There was a strict ritual distance between them. Uh, they were maintaining, uh, you know, uh, because of um, maintaining the ritual purity, uh, the untouchability was in practice, but uh, today these are not visible. Of course, it's it, it, though Indian society is a very complex. You cannot say with uh, with full conformity, or um, uh, we cannot draw a general statement that untouchability is no more. Uh, it is there, but but it is it has become invisible. Uh, untouchability abolition of 1955 or other legislation, uh, which has brought different, uh, which has you can say broken the barrier between various caste groups. So the various taboos, the restrictions, whatever prescriptions were uh, detected by the caste idea or ideology, you know those things are, have lost its importance and mostly it is because of the growth of individualism. An individual has become conscious of his own worth in the society. He is simply uh, not going to be driven away by the um, dogmas or the pre social prescription or the tradition what is being imposed upon him. So, now he, his, his mind is open, he can think judiciously, he can act, uh, uh, you know, act with, with uh, a pragmatic way. So, it is not possible to go with the old norm. So, that growth of individualism is also one of the responsible factor to bring changes in the caste norms and also the modern means of communications, the news legislation, the importance on the values of egalitarianism, uh, democratic principles, uh, secularism. So, those uh, new western values has also helped a lot to uh, demolish or you can say to uh, break the barrier uh, between various caste groups or uh, the, the, you know the, this is how we understand that caste old caste norm has lost its importance okay now moving to the next uh, slide caste no longer decides the occupational status of the individual as we have learned that hereditary occupation is one of the primary characteristic of the caste system which was saying that a person did not to think about his occupation that what type of economic activity that he must take up in future. It is already de uh, determined and decided at the time of birth. When he is born in a particular caste family, that means he is supposed to take up the ancestral occupation what is given to him. Okay, so, there was no choice at all, but is it the case in the present day? 
absolutely not. In the present day, that hereditary occupation is hardly found. Very few are following their ancestral occupations. Many have, uh, you know, they have adopted the new job opportunities, the new market conditions. So, there is a break, there is a change to hereditary occupation. And another important uh, factor to it is the breaking down of the Jasmani system. You know the Jasmani system which refers to the socio-economic interdependence between various caste groups which was uh, creating a model of division of labor in the village community is uh, is 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 found with uh, lesser Im importance or there is a sharp decline in the jasmani system so jasmani system was one of the very uh, important factor to continue with the hereditary occupation so with the losing importance of the jasmani system hereditary occupation is also not found and also the uh, emerging secular economic order what is secular economic order for example what are jobs and employment opportunities available in the industrial setup, in the other professional or economic setup, it is beyond caste background. It is not that you are you belong to upper caste um, family, so you have the right and privilege uh, to be employed. It is not like that, it is open to all. So, that secular economic order, urban job opportunity and the universal education. In education is made free and compulsory for all. So, all those are relevant uh, factor which has brought changes in the uh, that uh, you know um, occupational structure uh, as per the caste norm. So, the, but what we see the many sociologists what they have observed during their study that this kind of change is mostly applicable to the upper caste and the middle caste upper caste and the middle caste group. So, change is more reflected among upper and middle class caste group than lower caste group. That means, lower caste group are not much affected by heritage, uh, by, by the changes what has occurred in the occupational structure. So, many of them are still following their ancestral occupation because the more opportunities are available for the upper and the middle class people. So, they have come out of the caste barrier to explore themselves and that is how uh, the changes uh, affected more to upper caste people. So, uh, another important change that has taken place in the caste structure that is related to caste panchayat that the present day uh, system does not allow caste panchayat to operate though uh, it is still existing in some part of the country with its uh, previous rigidity. But in most pa part of the countries we know that caste panchayat that has been replaced by democratic panchayat what we say gram panchayat. Okay? So, what, what are the reasons why such changes got you know came into in the that you know the judiciary or you can say in this law and order matter of the caste system. We see that caste is no more uh, our sole decision making authority. You, you now the caste panchayat has lost its uh, previous dominance and importance in the practical social life due to many reasons. First of all, constitution has given equal right to everyone and for any dispute, any problem disturbances that occur, that is police system, that is judiciary system which is uh, which has to take up all these issues and find solution to all the problems. So, and uh, the caste panchayat which was existing during early days, it was biased and prejudiced by the upper caste norm. It was mostly going in favor of the upper caste people. Whenever there was any kind of violation of the caste norm, the punishment was very lighter. You can say punishment was just for the namesake to the upper caste people, but for the lower caste people the punishment was harsh. So, it was neither democratic it was not uh, judicious. So, people with uh, when they started to learn about their reality, when they attained higher education, when they got the support of the constitutional uh, uh, laws uh, to protect their rights. So, eventually uh, caste panchayat lost its 
importance because of more faith on the court of law for equality of justice. And another important change what we see with regard to endogamous marriage. That means endogamy is no more functioning with the previous rigidity. What is endogamy? We have already learned the marriage within one own caste group or marriage within one's own sub caste group. So, what we see that there is emergence of individual choices. An educated young man or young woman want to take decision for her future life. He or she is not ready to compromise with the decision of his family members what is being imposed upon them. So as a result, when he is uh, working outside or uh, pursuing his higher education in an educational institution and come in contact with a person of uh, we, uh, that shoot, suits to his mentality or his ideology, then uh, they decide to marry each other uh, despite of the caste differences. And the Hindu Marriage Act 1955, Special Marriage Act 1954 allowed such kind of intercaste marriages. So we see there is increasing rate of intercaste marriages because of emerging individual choices. And also in the families, parents nowadays are giving consent to the choice of their uh, choices of their youngsters. They are not imposing their ideas. Okay. Another example would be the matrimonial websites or the open advertisement through newspaper. In some cases, you might have observed that uh, uh, in some uh, advertisement. Uh, uh, columns there is uh, uh, you know there is some certain condition without caste preferences so whoever fulfill the requirements is welcome not necessarily that they must belong to one particular caste group or the same caste group so these are the changes are quite observable in the modern society so moving to uh, next Emergence of dominant caste. I have already told you about the concept dominant caste, the way Amenshinibus has introduced. So it is no more based on the ritual status. What is the prime characteristic of dominant caste? It is no more based on ritual status. So ritual status uh, basically uh, you know given to the upper caste people. So here dominant caste simply signify that in a particular locality upper caste not necessarily to be dominant. Uh, even the upper caste exists, they may take a back seat and a particular caste group who is ritually behind the upper caste may take the front seat, may dominate uh, in his locality provided who uh, that uh, dominant caste fulfill those following condition. What are those? They must have a numerical strength. The, the population of that particular caste group uh, must be enough. Then they must have modern education, must have access to modern education. Many of them must have employed in uh, government jobs and they must have, uh, you know, they must have landed property. And that as in the present world, political nexus is very important. So those who have economic strength, who have numerical strength, who have uh, no, knowledge as strength, so they have very good access to the political resources or political power. So the people of that caste group, you know, automatically become dominant in that area. So there are lots of instances what M. N. Srinivas has cited that not in all part of the country Brahmins are dominant, not the upper caste people are dominant. In some cases, uh, the intermediary caste groups, they have also shown their dominance in their respective areas like Patidars in the Gujarat, Redis in Andhra Pradesh, Khandayat in Odisha, Thakur in uh, North India, you know those uh, caste groups are regarded as dominant caste group. You must be knowing that if G. Bailey has studied a lot on the Khandayat caste group in Odisha. Uh, so that is how we come to know that Khandayat they enjoy lots of you know enjoy their dominance in our state. Okay, moving to next interplay of caste and politics. This is very important to understand. When you say that caste system has lost its ritual importance, that means it has adopted more political and economic uh, uh, power into it. So each caste group has transformed into an interest group. What, what do you mean by interest groups? A group which aims to fulfill its 
various interests, whether it's political, economic, uh, whatever it may be. Okay. Now the focus on the to maintain the religious purity, focus on to maintain the uh, ritual, uh, rituality is hardly found. More if uh, a person want to identify himself as upper caste or lower caste, it is it is basically for the political gain or for the economic gain. So, that is a uh, intermixture of caste and politics and in the grassroots politics caste is very prominent. You might have observed that when election come how politicians they move to the uh, villages, uh, to the slums, to the uh, local people uh, and mostly when uh, they meet the grassroots uh, you know people at the grassroots level you know that caste identity that becomes an instrument or weapon for them. So, a caste is very much used in the grassroots politics just to captivate uh, the mind of the people because people are still oriented to their caste identity to their caste background. So, this is how we see the intermixture of caste and politics. So, because politics is very important in the present days, what is politics after all to holding some amount of power, right? So, the Dalit caste group, the backward caste group, they gradually realized if they become united, they form an organization, then their interest will be protected. So, they started to form various organization, association, coalitions, okay? So, this has led to power politics. They have entered into uh, in a battlefield of politics. So, now we see that uh, mostly other backward classes, uh, the elite groups, they have, they have uh, identified themselves through a collective farming that is through political organizations. And it, this kind of intermixture of caste and politics is like a double edged sword. It has pros as well as cons. So, if you look at the positive benefit, of course, uh, the political pl platform has become a voice of the untouchables, has become, a, 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 you can say, a window for the deprived section. But at the same time, we feel that there is uh, a nasty game because of the intermixture of caste and politics. So, these are two fundamental outcome, one is the politicization of the caste system, how the caste issues are being politicized, adding more color and vibes into it, so that the innocent simple minded people will be, uh, you know, uh, will be motivated by uh, the politicians who have uh, wrong motive. And another uh, effect is the casteism in politics, because still caste holds that much significance in our country. So, casteism is much felt in the present day politics. As a result, we find there are many political parties on the basis of uh, caste line, like uh, Bahujan Samajbadi Party, Samajbadi Party, you know, there are many political organizations, mostly are in the southern uh, part of the country, and the aim is just to capture power, it not, not just to think about the benefit of their caste community, it is uh, to maintain power and we see that it is not a very good healthy practice for a democratic country like India. So, moving to next. So, these are the pictures what uh, uh, you can focus on, like the first picture, the picture of Maya Bhatti, who as you know that she has formed, uh, she is the leader of uh, a political, caste based political party. And the second picture where you see a political leader, leader addressing the common man and the political leader addressing the common man uh, on the basis of the caste. Line. So, caste has become a weapon, an instrument in the hand of political leaders to motivate common people, to motivate uh, the mass because you know the, the common man is very much emotional. He does not understand uh, what is the actual reality. So, whatever promises are given uh, by those leaders at the time of election, he simply takes for granted and he says perhaps uh, this is the truth. So, it is very easy to motivate people uh, on the basis of the religion, in, in the name of religion or in the name of caste. This is how it is happening. But, but, but the pathetic part of it is that when caste based, pol caste based political party holds power, they fail to give justice to all type of people. They, their focus is uh, limited to one section of the people. So, somehow it is not healthy for the democratic functioning uh, of the political system. 
and the third picture that that speaks about a political organization and this is uh, known as Nikhilo Odisha Khetriya Kranti Morcha. Okay. This caste uh, uh, based organization which is an example of uh, uh, what you say the raging political consciousness among the among a particular caste group. Uh, as this is this is an upper caste organization. Similarly, there are many lower caste organization. So all those caste based organization basically aim to fulfill all those requirements interest of the members of their own party. Okay. So moving to next increasing number of caste conflict. So there is uh, uh, we know that there are lots of awareness among the people due to modern education, due to uh, improved uh, legislation or uh, due to awareness campaigning. So this has somehow uh, affected people to think about their life, new democratic and egalitarian values. So that increasing awareness among the low caste people has made them you know, uh, conscious of their own right. So now they are not ready to accept the system the way it is was being uh, imposed upon them. So they are coming to the front of uh, fighting for their cause and their voice is also presented in a collective platform and many such instances like the anti-Brahminism movement which occurred in South started by the Dalit groups. So uh, you know gradually it has taken a political uh, form. So th th there are thousands, uh, there are hundreds of examples which speaks about uh, this kind of uh, uh, movement which has taken place by the low caste members, a uh, low caste organization. Then increase of caste violence in North India is also another uh, harsh reality. It, it's, it's not at all a healthy one, but uh, what happens because the people of the uh, people who are in the bottom now they are educated, they gradually become, they are gradually you know getting knowledge of the uh, reality. So they have started to raise their voice, but it is not acceptable to the people of the upper caste people, upper caste group. So it is very prominent and clear in the northern part of the India where caste dominance in the every sphere of their social life. So when the low caste people or the people of the Dalit group, they want to raise their voice, they are brutally, they are uh, you know suppressed and this leads to caste violence, violence. So there are a number of such incidents of caste violence. And there are instances of caste rivalries. Uh, caste conflict between various caste groups. Again, the uh, motive is very political and economic. It is not ritual and religious, as we have discussed with the with the beginning of the class. That caste has changed its color. It's not religious or ritual anymore. It's more political and economic oriented. So, caste rivalry, which is taking place nowadays in our society, it is also based on. Uh, this political and economic interest. Some of the examples like Kamas and Redis in the Andhra Pradesh or the rivalry between Lingayats and Okaligas in Mysore or Rasput and uh, 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 the rivalry between Rasput and Bhumihar in uh, Bihar. Okay. So there are many parts of the country where those dominant caste groups they are fighting with each other just to hold their position. So what we came to know about the caste rivalry, this simply indicates that low caste group members, they are gradually understanding their self worth and they, they are much oriented towards the dignity of life. So as a result, uh, such reactions are coming out, but most important thing is that, that there should be a change in the mindset of the upper caste people. Unless we invite changes in all sphere of the society, we cannot expect a peaceful, healthy society, right? Though caste conflict is required, but it must have its limit. Um, it must have its uh, limit. Okay. Now coming, uh, let's uh, share. Let me share the uh, images with you. In the first image, what does it show? That the man holding a banner, showing that. Casteism 
is man made okay and uh, which must be broken casteism is a man made barrier let's break it okay so this shows the gradually emerging caste consciousness among the low caste people because they also need a dignity of life and the second picture you see the people how with full of uh, force energy they are holding the picture of baba saheb ambedkar so that that symbolizes their strength that symbolizes their awareness how they are taking a stand to move up in the social system now coming to the next now these are some of the pictures the first picture that is showing a uh, caste conflict you know because of um, the mutual uh, antagonism uh, between various caste groups it often comes out in a violent form so and the second picture where the upper caste people they are protesting against reservation because somehow as they felt that reservation as a policy is hampering their interest so each caste group whether it is upper caste or lower caste is coming to front in a collective way through their organization to put forth their demand but uh, it must not cross the limit it must not be uh, must not take a violent form okay moving to next uh, about the factor responsible for the change so far we discussed about whatever changes that has affected in the structure of the caste system as well as in the function of the caste system as we came to know that most of the changes that has occurred in the behavioral aspect in the ritual pattern or in uh, with regard to the values or the caste norms the what has brought those changes this is important to understand or what are those factors which has brought changes in the caste system the most prominent factor is the modern education since independence education is being given much more importance irrespective of caste or religious or racial background so when uh, people of the low caste or who are at the bottom strata of the society they attend education they understand their stand in the society they become closer to the social uh, reality so that helps to bring more awareness and consciousness for themselves and this helps helps them to fight against any sort of social injustice that uh, is being imposed upon them similarly the forces of industrialization and urbanization which has brought massive changes in uh, the economic front in the cultural front because it has given rise to more job opportunities or employment it has generated many uh, employments so uh, people from different caste background they have rushed to urban or city centers the what we say the it has led to migration in sick of their job and for where it is not possible to maintain that ritual distance so increasing amount of urbanization or industrialization somehow has broken the barrier the ritual barrier between various caste groups and in the process modern means of transport and communication has helped a lot so it's not possible to maintain that ritual purity or, or distance when you are living in a crowd when the people from different corners of the country with different cultural caste or religious background they have come over at one place and are uh, living together similarly increase in the importance of market economy and wealth as in the present context it is not uh, the salvation moksha or uh, the karma papa punya you know those words have least significance the present day society is more focused on survival issues on the issues of sustenance how to live with dignity what resources should be available so that the life would be secured to more focus on the material comfort wealth income economy uh, more uh, overall when you speak about quality of life uh, you know those things have you know uh, gradually have diminished the values of the caste norms and the new laws 
new uh, social movements, the emergence of class structure, all those new things that has um, in, that has been incorporated or that has come into the modern society that has brought changes in the age-old caste norm. And two important processes like Sanskritization and Westernization, uh, similarly secularization, democratization, all those social processes has helped people to move towards uh, maintaining or establishing an egalitarian society, a society which will be free from any sort of discrimination. So, Sanskritization though it has, uh, uh, it has brought some functional changes in the caste system, but M. M. Srinivas says that the structural hierarchy uh, still intact. However, uh, these forces of the modern society are gradually inviting changes in the caste system. Okay? So, today we learned about the various changes of the caste system. So, let us sum up. So, what, how can you conclude now? So, well, uh, coming to the conclusion, we must understand that caste system is not in the process of abolition, rather making adequate adjustment with the modern forces of the change. So, it is, it, it is uh, the reality that we must accept that caste system is not going to be abolished. It will remain maybe for times to come, but but, but caste is so cleverly designed that like, like a chameleon, it changes its, culture, it changes its color, it tuned to the changing circumstances of the society. So, instead of uh, getting eliminated, it is strengthening its base by adopting new changes into it. But though, though changes are not giving focus on the religious or the ritual aspect, rather it is giving more focus on the political and economic aspect. So, present caste operate more as an interest group. The market driven new economy, the rise of caste identity, access to quality education and various governmental schemes and provisions to empower Dalit people, the low caste people have helped a lot to make this change possible. So, despite of various measures, caste inequality still exists in the modern India as a form of exclusion and exploitation. So, this part that we must understand that though we have achieved a lot, lots of changes has taken place in the caste system. It has uh, helped the Dalit people to raise their uh, voice to come up in the socio-economic ladder, but still the social exclusion, the exploitation that, that still persists in the country. It is because of the upper caste my mentality, the mindset which has remained unchanged. When we see, uh, when you look at the governmental provision, the constitutional provisions, these are very supportive, but with this uh, we cannot expect the total change. Uh, in order to bring a total change, towards establishing uh, an egalitarian peaceful social order, first of all we must emphasize on the perceptional change, must emphasize on bringing uh, awareness among the people uh, of various caste groups, not simply uh, bringing awareness among the people of the Dalit or the lower caste group, also to bring awareness among the it's uh, higher caste uh, members okay, uh, from all section of the uh, people, so that we can uh, build up a healthy society. So, this is how mm, uh, we need to conclude here. I hope uh, the concept is understood. Thank you all.